because we're interested in spaces, presumably. And um, we're all inspired to create beautiful, nurturing homes, but often something in our psychology seems to get in the way. So what is it if you're going to a talk or you're watching this on Zoom and you know, you've know you heard lots of inspiring things and you go away and you think, right, I'm going to put that feng shui, feng shui sorry, in practice and something stops you doing it. And so that's really frustrating, isn't it? Um, let's see if I can get this. So when you understand, can you hear me all okay? Yeah? So when you understand what's underneath the clutter, so particularly talking about clutter here, then, then that empowers you to make a shift. So why is it that you can't implement some of these amazing things that you're learning this weekend? And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what some of those psychological things might be that are preventing you from having your best life making room for your future, I like to say. So imagine that you have a, um, a home that you'd create that you knew was holding you and that, sorry, that you knew was holding you back and how to overcome those obstacles. So a beautiful space that is really holding you and inspiring you and I like to think of the home as like your battery charger. It's the place that you go back to recharge, plug yourself in to your home, and then off you go back into the world again. Obviously not lately during COVID. But, um, so what if you're going home and your home is, is draining you and it's not a place that, that kind of uplifts and inspires you? So just think for a minute about a home that really uplifts and inspires you and, and recharges you, revitalizes you. So whatever, however you might design that, however that might look, what would it be like for you? It's a beautiful, uplifting environment with, where you've managed to employ your feng shui principles. So a cluttered, badly organized home drains your energy, as I've said. And not only does it drain your energy, but it's it becomes something that stops you being in flow, but also it stops you from living your best life. It stops you from creating what you want to create. So quite often my clients would say to me, oh, if I had this home space clear, then I would do this, or I would invite people around, or I would um, write my book, or if I didn't have a load of stuff in the box room, then maybe I'd have a painting studio or something or a yoga studio so you know quite often there's something that's stopping us being able to really expand into our potential so some of the things some of the examples that people often say to me is um, I don't know where to start I feel overwhelmed I'm full of anxiety I procrastinate I'm depressed um, I've got conflicting needs you know I don't really think I can be bothered and um, maybe I'm I've inherited my mum's stuff so I don't really you know so no one likes living in a home that doesn't support you to live the best life and everyone deserves a home that nurtures and inspires them so what are the stakes if we don't do something about it if we don't actually address this blockage if you want to call it a blockage of chi then we stay stuck. Clutter breeds clutter. So I, you know, when I work with people and I say, look, how, how come you've got um, five or six or seven pairs of scissors? Because I can't ever find them. I can't ever find my scissors, so I end up going and buying some more. So that so you can see how with all of that chaos and clutter that you end up creating more of it because you can't find anything. So you you know you end up buying more. Um, so it drains your energy, like I said. There's no sort of um, recharging. It's you come home. So, I mean, I've even had clients say to me, um, I actually go out to get away from my house. Yeah. Um, and then the time that's wasted hunting for the scissors or hunting for the keys or hunting for the important documents and you don't know where, don't know where they are. 
So um, if you can let go of what doesn't serve you and connect to what matters, make the most of your space, you can live your best life. So, um, so I'm Helen Sanderson and I am really happy to be here today. Um, very, very honoured that you've invited me and I've worked with hundreds of people to declutter their homes, redesign their lives and, um, and I'm the author of the Home Declutter Kit, which is at the back if you'd like to have a look. And I also have a book coming out um, next spring, which is all about, it's a series of stories of people that I've worked with. Um, so I offer an, an initial consultation and we, you know, I've, so I've talked to hundreds of people and they've told me the same thing over and over and over again. So I feel like I'm an expert of that now. Um, I'm also a psychotherapist, an interior designer, I'm an interfaith minister <laughs> and uh, a lover of feng shui. So um, that's, that's a little bit about me. So I'm going to talk to you today about the 10 psychological blocks that I've come across in my work over the last 15 years. And you might relate to one of them, you might relate to all of them, you might relate to none of them. But if you don't relate to any of them, you probably know someone that will. Okay, it may be a client of yours if you're a, a consultant, um, or it may be a friend. And quite often people come up to me and they say, I've got a friend who da da da. So this affects us in some way or another. Um, so the first thing is health. Quite often people end up with a cluttered home because they've had a period of ill health. Maybe that's mental health, physical health. Something has happened, so life has dealt, um, what do you want to call it? A challenge or a burden or, or something has happened in life and the daily maintenance of everyday stuff has got too much and then it's just accumulated. So this is kind of, you know, one of those things that happens and, you know, a bereavement maybe. And so what I really recommend is, is at times, the times like that, that we, that we really ask for help, we get, reach out and get a helping hand to get us back to, to where we would like to be, back to perhaps where we were before. You know, I've worked with people that have, have suddenly got physical um, conditions and then they physically, they can't do the, the clearing of stuff, they need help. So the key is really about asking for help, whether that's someone to talk to or physically someone to help practically. So values, um, how is it if you're a really um, social person, you're an extrovert, you like to go out and you like to spend your time socializing and your values aren't sitting at home clearing your clutter or sorting out the house or something. I worked with somebody once who had a beautifully organized home and her husband had his own shed and office and it was completely chaotic. She'd managed to get him nicely contained in his office. <laughs> um, but he had a completely different value set to hers. You know, he, 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 her value was beauty and order and his value was fixing things and finding out how they worked. So it's not everybody has the same value set. And maybe, you know, if, you, if you're someone with clutter, maybe that isn't your highest value to, her, to create order. And, and um, so I really, uh, I guess my, where I'm coming from is really always a place of compassion and understanding. So it's okay if you don't, if that's not your highest value, it's really okay. And then it's really about making a decision. So it's not my highest value, but maybe I do want to just, um, attribute some time to get myself back to where I'd like to be and then learn to maintain it a bit better. Um, personality. So I worked with a lot of people who are very creative and they are um, they're chaotic. It comes with the, it comes with the deal, right? It, um, creative people tend to have 10 projects on the go and they've only got time for maybe one of them or, or half of one of them or something. So it comes with a personality type. 
maybe that personality has ADHD or ADD or something. And it, and so quite often I find that a lot of my clients do have a little bit of ADHD and they're just sort of, they don't know how to focus. They're just sort of, I'm onto this and then I'm onto that and I'm doing 10 things at once and, and, and they're, you know, it's speeding on. So um, that's, that's a really common trait um, with clutter and um, once uh, I knew a woman who ha I felt had this most amazing balance. She was an artist and she had this immaculate flat and then you went into her studio and it was absolute mess. And I just thought that was a beautiful way of honouring her inner artist that needed to be chaotic and expressive and just not really care and her other part of herself which wanted to have order. And I thought that was a really beautiful way of balancing those two sides. But not everybody perhaps has that same self-understanding or the space or the facility to be able to do that. But I think it's really, this is all about, you know, awareness and understanding. If you're a creative type, then, you know, compassion. It's okay that you're, that you're chaotic and you can learn. So um, this is what I say to people when we start a decluttering project together, that quite often there's this dread or this sense of, oh my God, I'm going to, Know, speak to Helen and she's going to say I'm oh, a complete mess or whatever and then they say they figure out that it's okay it's going to be okay and then they get motivated and then they're like, I'm finally I'm going to deal with this pile of pile of stuck energy and then we get into action and like, there's a sense of relief like thank goodness and then at some point boredom sets in now if you're a creative person you don't normally like to do things persistently then boredom sets in or it's a big job and it's taking a long time so at some point things start going a bit sort of the energy perhaps starts to drop and then self-doubt self starts to set in and then giving up now the th key thing about this is that giving up happens just before you're about to succeed and have success now this is particularly typical of creative types that they that they'll give up just before they're just about to complete something and perhaps start another project. And actually the completing is a really big key that I found in working through and solving clutter problems and any problems actually. <laughs> so fear, that's another thing. People often come to me and they're like, oh my God, I, I actually, if I go near that, room full of stuff then I'm going to feel like I might find something that I don't want to find so actually I'll just keep the door closed. Um, fear is a really big debilitating emotion so what we most need to know and if you think about um, the story of the holy grail is actually that finding the grail is to go into the place of most fear so actually the grail quest was about really going into the place that you're most afraid of. And actually that's true of clutter. If you've got a room of clutter and you're afraid of it, that actually you have to go in there and face that fear. And um, as they say, feel the, feel the fear and do it anyway. And you might even find some treasures in there. So, um, and sometimes you need a helping hand. So avoidance, I, I kind of want to say how many of you are avoiding dealing with something. So <laughs> um, maybe on Zoom you can sort of like, but avoiding comes under the um, category of procrastination. You know that one? Yeah. Um, or distraction. So I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do declutter this, my desk or my filing cabinet or whatever it is and but I think I might make a cake or you know the classic thing if you've got an essay to write you know because I'm studying at the moment as well so and I find an immense fascination in cleaning all of a sudden and you know so so I mean I'm not going to sort of like there is a reason why we do end up doing that because there is a need for for calm and order before you can think and that's the whole perhaps the whole point of, of what I'm talking about is that we do sometimes need to create that space in order to think. And I guess the question is, you need to ask yourself, am I setting up my desk in order to work or to do something, create something, or am I avoiding it? <laughs> yeah. 
So, um, so people who are procrastinators or get distracted a lot, um, what I always say to them is clutter is decisions that haven't been made. And that could be, um, it doesn't even have to be about stuff. It could be that you've got a cluttered mind and that you haven't just said, sat down with yourself and said, okay, where am I actually going to go on holiday? Or um, what is it that I need to do um, with this pile of stuff? So it is just about sitting down with yourself and saying, let's just sit down and make these decisions. What's the worst that's going to happen? You know, maybe my, maybe, maybe I do throw away something I regret, you know, is that, is, is that going to kill me? You know, so I always say to people, if you're a great procrastinator, you need a buddy, you need an accountability buddy or a coach or somebody, and it could be your, could be your grandma or whatever. She, maybe she's be really happy to send you a text and say, did you do your three hours commitment today or something? So accountability really helps us keep focused with our commitments. Okay, so the next one is learned behaviors. Um, so this is, perhaps you grew up in a home with that was very cluttered and disorganized and chaotic. And you then, now you find yourself um, and you've created the same thing. And that's usually because it feels familiar. We create what's familiar. We recreate what our family home felt like. Or you had... Um, a very organized, completely regimented home. And it was so regimented that you, as a child, you could, you were so restricted that you couldn't even really play and express yourself, that you rebelled and you just went, sod it. And now you just pff, throw things everywhere. So you're in rebellion. Okay. So either way, it's like we, we kind of, we either inherit the, the sort of the good or the bad or whatever, but the point is, is it what you really want now? You're an adult. Do you really want this? Do you really want to stay rebelling? Do you really want to stay recreating the family home that you grew up in? You know, if you were lucky and it was really ordered and, you know, I was really lucky. My mum was quite organised, so thanks, mum. <laughs> but, you know, quite often when I speak to my clients, I do quite an intensive um interview with them and we usually discover that one of the parents is was a hoarder or a clutter or something and then it becomes like a bonding activity like a, a a way of relating or staying close to that that family member and if that's kind of lovely but if you're an alcoholic and your parent was an alcoholic you know it's not necessarily <laughs> a good idea anymore so it's like okay well actually I don't want to bond with this behavior anymore. I hope that kind of makes a bit of sense. So there's so many really brilliant. So if you're, um, if you've got behaviors that you don't like, there's some really good books and there's some really good tools and I offer coaching and, you know, there's some brilliant coaches out there that will help you develop new, healthy, more life sustaining habits. Obviously I particularly work with people in their homes and how they interact with their space and their stuff. But um, learning habits, it's, it's a challenge, it's much more, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And, and they say that if you stick at it for 30 days, you're more likely to um, keep hold of that habit. Um, I've got a house charter, and when I work with people, I get them to commit to what are they going to be their bottom line rules. So I'm going to make the bed every day, or I'm not going to go to bed until I've done the washing up or something like that, whatever it is, simple things. But you know, the way I see it is if you come down to yesterday's washing up, it's a bit like being in debt. You kind of like you're washing up yesterday's stuff before you start with today. It's a bit like I now have to pay off yesterday's debt before I can start saving for today. So if you see, if you see everything that you do in the home as a way of kind of investing in yourself, and everything that you leave undone or sort of for tomorrow, tomorrow maybe never comes. And then it is a bit like one day it will catch up with you and that debt will have to be paid off. And it's like you're kind of walking backwards a little bit. So the aspirational rules are the ones that you get to when you've mastered the top ones. <laughs> okay, so. Um, 
So sentimentality is one of the most trickiest, stickiest ones because we have, um, we have an attachment and a relationship to objects and they then, they then replace the people that we've lost, our loved ones. And it can be the most difficult one to deal with. Um, I really, um, so I really want to, people to not to feel that they have to let go of all of their precious things because they are kind of what make our life. But if you think about, if you went to an art gallery and you were looking at a beautiful piece of art and then there's a reason why they put it with lots of space around it, isn't there? And if you have so many other paintings around it, it's the eye is trying to figure out which one to look at. So I really encourage people to choose a few really beautiful sentimental things that have meaning, that are beautiful, that you connect with. And that when you let go of the other ones, that you're not dishonoring that person in any way, but you can let them go in a way that is, um, is honorable. So, um, in my kit, we talk about there's several ways of dealing with memories, and one of them might be to do a creative project. So maybe you've got some old um, kids' drawings or something, and you can maybe you can create something, uh, frame something up. You can photograph things. You can um, you can get things made nowadays out of your kids' baby grow, or you know um, a lost relative their old shirts or something, you can get things made so that they're not just stuck if stuff in a box or in a drawer somewhere and that they bring them back to life but you keep some of that sentiment, sentimental meaning as something. This one is a just a, a framed load of tickets that somebody had from a holiday that they'd been on which was just stuffed in a box and now they're in, framed up. So if you really think about something that's sentimental it needs to have pride of place or not just shoved in a box in a in a room in a, or in a loft or in a garage or wherever. So then this is another one. So a lot of this one, a lot of the stories in my book are about some of the things that kind of came out of the work that I did with people. Some of the stories that they told me in the work that we did together. And sometimes clutter can be a bit of a burial mound. It can be a place that we, that we hide away something that we don't want to look at. Um, so, and again, coming back to compassion, it's okay. Um, it's okay to have had trauma. It's okay to not want to deal with something. Um, I have in my, in my kit, I have a card that's called the gremlins. And we say, gremlins can be put away. We don't need to deal with gremlins today, but maybe we give ourselves maybe a year or something. So if you've just been through a divorce or something and you don't want to look at that stuff, you need to have a time that you can put it away. But if you, how long have you been putting it away for? You know, have you been putting it away or putting it off? So um, the most important thing is to have compassion for yourself and to have kindness and to have support. You know, if, you're, if, you, if you have a box room that is full of stuff from your divorce, I mean, I've worked with people who 10 years later went through their wardrobe and found their wedding dress that, and they were divorced. And it was really traumatic. Um, so we took the wedding dress out and we got everything and we laid it out and we put flowers and candles and ritual and honored that period of her life. And then she took photos and, and then she sold it and it was done. But it was, you know, it was a gremlin for her. You know, sometimes it can be much more serious trauma from childhood, but either way, it's really important to seek support um, and to be compi compassionate and kind. So this is the one that I really, this is the one that I find most kind of intriguing and exciting is that um, quite often I meet people and they say, you know, Helen, I'm really tidy at work, but then when I get home, I just chuck it all on the floor. You know, it's like, I can't understand how I can be so organized at at my desk and yet at home I just don't really care and it's this thing about you know sometimes we do things for other people's approval so at work you know you're not going to show your sort of slobby side at work because you want to get you know you want to you want to keep your job so we often we have two conflicting parts that maybe they're clashing 
So this is the, what I call the impasse. Maybe you've got a little bit of both of these. I thought I'd put these, so I thought they look quite sort of might, <laughs> might spice up the day a bit. <laughs> um, but you can have both of these, and they come out in different places. A bit of um, Apollonian and Dionysian energy. So um, I'm a trained voice dialogue um, uh, facilitator, and so we would talk about the different parts that you might have that live in your house with you. So you might have a pleaser, you might have a pusher, a perfectionist. Quite often the perfectionist is the one that goes to work. The slob comes home, yeah? Anyone relate to that? <laughs> um, so you've got your inner critic. It's usually the one that's quite connected to the procrastinator. Um, the protector controller, no one's coming in my house, Not no one. <laughs> Um, and then the responsible self. Um, as I said, I'm studying at the moment, so I'm so responsible. I'm um, One of my clients this morning, the other day, said to me, a child who's four said, when's Helen going to come and play with me? <laughs> I just thought that was just so, you know, obviously I was in a very responsible role and I'm, you know, in responsible self very much. And I think he was kind of trying to tell me that I need to play a little bit. So, um, so as you can see, each, each of these primary selves has a not necessarily a shadow, but a disowned part. So perhaps you might have, you might live in your slob at home, but you've got a, a often my clients who are probably in their slob, you know, flutter everywhere, they don't really care. But they say, actually, I'm a perfectionist. And I say, I know, <laughs> I can believe it. So each one of these, we might live in one, but there'll be a disowned self on the other side. And so, as we see, and then each one has kind of a positive and a negative side. So perhaps your perfectionist is really helpful because it gives you high standards, means that if you're doing a, a report, it's going to be really detailed. It's going to have everything that you need in it. The downside of the perfectionist is it's a little nitpicky, you know, a little bit sort of critical. Um, the pusher keeps you motivated, makes you makes you do your deadlines, but it does put you under a lot of pressure. Okay, so if if you're living in these aspects, that too much leaning to one side, it's going to put you a little bit out of balance psychologically, and then that might manifest in your home. Of course, what we're looking for is balance. So we've all got all of those things and, you know, there's nothing wrong with the slob. Sometimes we need to slob out, right? That's what the weekends are for. And then the last one is denial. Admit, so that obviously if you're, if you're in denial, um, I, haven't got, I haven't got any clutter or there's nothing wrong with my home or whatever, then as with any sort of issue that's going on, the first thing is to admit that you've got a, a problem and that you need help. So it's a, you know, ask for help. That's the the solution for that one. And, and and ultimately, if someone's in denial and you're trying to tell them, look, you know, you really need to lose weight or you really need to declutter your home or something, then it's just gonna it's just gonna create more resistance. So um, it's got something that's got to come from within. You know, so I, if you know somebody who's a hoarder and you've heard this talk, then I really don't recommend that you go and. You know, because actually what it does is it creates more resistance. So, how am I doing for time? What time do I need to finish? Now? Oh, ten, to, ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, so in the process that I use um, when I work with people is I like to visualize a garden. And so if you just for a minute imagine a garden and it's completely overgrown, full of brambles. In fact, it's so overgrown that you don't even know what, how big the garden is, what's in it, and what it could even look like. So the first thing that you have to do is the weeding. You have to go in the garden and cut back the brambles, pull up, cut the lawn, pull up all those um, ground elders and you know all of the stuff. And once you've done that, once you've got rid of the weeds, that i.e. the stuff that you don't need, then you can see what you've got. And suddenly you realize, wow, actually in here, there is a beautiful apple tree and a rose bush 
and maybe even some daffodils under, underneath. Everything in that garden was completely starved of life because of the, all the weeds. Um, so once you've seen your space, you can then do your planting plan, which is the point at which you decide where things are going to go. And this is where you get your feng shui consultant in and they tell you how to re, you know, make the best of your space. So that's the planting plan. Then they've come in and they've done that, or I've come in and we've reorganized, made it beautiful. The next thing you've got to do is maintain it. Because like every garden, if you don't keep maintaining it, it's going to grow back to weeds. So the same thing's going to happen. You can get, um, get me in or somebody or declutter your home. And if you don't maintain that space and keep that chi flowing and keep all of those things, putting them away and doing, creating your new habits, it's going to go back to how it was before. So the key thing is maintenance. So as with a garden, you would mow the lawn, you would feed the plants, you would water the plants. Yeah. And that is, that is, if I to express really clearly, that is so important. <laughs> Okay, so this is the kit. This is um, the product that you used, and this is basically setting it up so that people can, as I said, clutter is decisions that haven't been made. So this is a decision-making process, and I put in my 15 years of experience the decisions that I feel that you need to make in a box to make it easier for you. But remember, this is just the weeding phase. Yeah, so this was set up for a paper declutter. And this was a before and after. So this was like a horribly, um, not just ugly, but stuck and sort of heavy shelf that we read, you know, we did the weeding and we did the planting. Then we put it away and now they maintain it. And it's much easier to maintain because everything has its place. It's a place for everything. Yeah. So um, you can book a free consultation with me via my website. And I've been doing these consultations for, uh, I don't know, nearly 15 years. So, and I love doing them. Um, so imagine, again, just for a moment, opening the door to a beautifully designed, clutter-free home, aligned with feng shui principles, so the chi can flow into your life and your home. How would that be? So when you understand the psychology of what's underneath your clutter, which one of those 10 things is really blocking you from moving forward, it empowers you to make the shift that you need to make and make room for your future. 